In 2015, something momentous happened in Scotland, something that 50 years earlier would have been unthinkable. For the first time, the leaders of the three largest political parties in Scotland were women, and not only that, one of them was the First Minister. To become First Minister is special, and it is a big responsibility. To make history as the first woman First Minister is even more so. I hope that it sends a strong, positive message to girls and young women, indeed to all women across our land. Seeing Nicola Sturgeon, Ruth Davidson and Kezia Dugdale leading their parties and hearing women's voices ringing around the chamber here at Holyrood was remarkable. But what was happening here in the Parliament was being repeated in workplaces and communities across Scotland. After years of fighting to have their voices heard, women were stepping up to lead. In the past two decades, women have found new kinds of confidence. It's amazing when you've got fire in your belly what you can do. Aspects of our lives that had been hidden have been brought into the light. And as well as taking charge of the present, we've reclaimed our past. But change has not always been easy. Social media provides a vehicle for the most awful abuse of women. In the last 20 years, women have proven themselves natural leaders in all walks of life. But sometimes it's come at a price, and it's taken great determination to stick with it. But in doing so, they've transformed the country. Back in 1999, I was here in Edinburgh to present the BBC's live coverage of a momentous event for Scotland. Good morning from the historic heart of Edinburgh on this beautiful summer's day. This morning we're going to witness the symbolic start to a new chapter in Scotland's history. The Queen is here today to open formally the new Scottish Parliament, 300 years since the last Parliament sat in Scotland's capital. I remember the day the Scottish Parliament was officially opened really vividly. It was incredibly exciting, there were crowds everywhere. I was hosting a special programme for the BBC. What I particularly remember was when the MSPs gathered near St Giles to process to the temporary building on the mound. Almost 40% of them were female. It was something few other parliaments in the world could boast. But this wasn't the result of any gradual progress. This was a concerted campaign to make sure that women had a voice. That campaign can be traced back to the 1987 general election. And we will indeed endeavour to serve the people of these islands in the future as we have in the past. A massive victory returned the Conservatives to power, while in Scotland, the Conservative vote had collapsed. Many Scots felt that their views were not being heard, but for Scotland's women, this feeling was nothing new. Of 72 MPs elected to Scottish seats, just three were women. Margaret Ewing for the SNP, Ray Meekie for the Liberal Democrats, and Maria Fife for Labour. We're not going to be up with the present state of affairs. Having women holding 4% of the Scottish parliamentary seats is something we're not going to tolerate. As demand grew for a Scottish Assembly, women sensed a unique opportunity. Two key players in the campaign that followed were Yvonne Strachan and Alice Brown. Yvonne was part of the SDUC Women's Committee and convener of the Scottish Convention of Women. In the political sphere, in public life, and in the movement at large, our representation is poor. We're underrepresented, and if we want change, Congress, then we'll have to do something concrete to achieve it, because it won't come by voluntary means. And Alice was an academic, specialising in politics and women's representation. So when it came to 1987, what did things look like? Well, I think this document demonstrates what things looked like, because we have Maria Fife, 
the only woman. Oh, this is a labour intake. This is a labour intake. And there she is wearing her red and she's surrounded by a sea of men in grey and blue, some of them wearing red ties. I mean, how stark is that? It demonstrates just in that very one picture what it looked like and what it must have felt like. In 1989, politicians, church leaders, trade unionists and others formed the Scottish Constitutional Convention and met for the first time to discuss the possibilities for a Scottish Assembly. Today's first meeting in Edinburgh was boycotted by the Conservative Party and by the Scottish Nationalists. Scotland has the right to insist on articulating its own demands and grievances rather than have them articulated for it by a distant government. There were around 140 men and just 23 women. It was clear that something had to be done. Where did 50-50 come from? The actual debate about how you should have 50-50 came from the S2C Women's Committee. Here we were, I mean, when in a lifetime do you get an opportunity not only to create a new house, the new electoral system, new procedures, and from day one have equal representation? It seemed to us a no-brainer. <laughs> I think the problem was that for many others it was a hugely radical. Mm -hmm. What were the barriers to entry at Westminster? There was a supply issue in terms of the number of women coming forward. But then you have to ask, why don't they come yeah. forward? And think, then, how do you overcome these barriers? The character of this new institution had to be different. Mm -hmm. It had to be collaborative. It needed to look differently. It has to be, have, you know, crashes. Hours of operating needed mm -hmm. to be different. Mm -hmm. It was phenomenal. Down even to the stage of saying, the, sh the shape of the parliament, parliament. Mm -hmm. should be a horseshoe and not two separate devices. Yeah. yeah, it wasn't taken seriously in some parts. It was kind of it'll go away. It's a wee bit <laughs> yes. of a fashion list, you know. <laughs> they'll, they'll forget <laughs> about it, you know. But the campaigners didn't forget, and 50/50 built momentum. It didn't become a legal requirement, but some parties did commit to fielding more women as candidates. Alice advised Labour on how to do this. In one of our evening meetings, late into the night, we had a big map of Scotland. Yeah. And we were sitting there thinking, well, what are the constituencies that Labour might win and how might we twin them? Because the idea was that you should have a man and a woman that would almost share two constituencies. The woman with the highest number of votes would get one of the constituencies and the man with the highest number of votes would get the other. But you were trying to twin winnable seats. And suddenly you could see a lot of the young men thinking, wait a minute, I might not have got a seat now because this is going to be, one of them is going to be a woman. So the reality started to hit as well about what, what it might look like. The first election for the Scottish Parliament took place in 1999. 48 women were elected, representing more than a third of the Parliament. Among them were Annabel Goldie, who had become the first woman to lead the Scottish Conservatives, and Wendy Alexander, who would later become the first woman to lead the Scottish Labour Party. Labour actually achieved 50-50, with 28 men and 28 women. I think what was just so important about that and so historic was that on one day, that one occasion, that one election, more women were elected to represent Scottish constituencies than had ever been elected in the 80 years since women could stand for election to the Westminster Parliament. I mean, that's stunning. I think when people, you know, hear that statistic, mm -hmm. it kind of just reinforces why this was mm -hmm. such an important thing to try to push for equal representation and to have that massive increase. Yeah. So when the Parliament first opened, I remember being privileged to be invited and I remember feeling very, very emotional because suddenly, physically, you just saw the difference from Maria being the lone woman with her red outfit because in the sea of colour, it was amazing. It just brought together all the hard work and, and all the campaigning. Although women had made progress on representation in the new parliament, cultural ideas around domestic work and care were more stubborn. The burden of these tasks still fell largely on women, and their labour was often taken for granted and unseen. The 
issue of undervaluing what has traditionally been seen as women's work hit the headlines in 2003 when public sector nursery nurses decided to go out on strike over their pay and working conditions. Jill McNaughton and Lorraine Miller were on the picket line in Dundee. That photo there with the megaphone, that's oh, just yeah, a classic. That's yeah, because that's the funny. first time somebody gave me that, I was reading a speech, just could hear myself, and I thought, oh, no, and all you heard was hey, as I laughed through it. <laughs> By the end, I loved that megaphone. Yeah. Look, you just become so confident, you can do things like that, you know? The largest union representing nursery nurses in Scotland was Unison. Carol Ball was a union convener and chair of the Nursery Nurses Working Party. Nursery nurses don't want to be doing it. We don't want to disadvantage any child. But as I say, we are resolute in getting a fair salary. So what was the origin of the dispute? We had been raising our concerns through our trade union about the lack of a review of our pay, not about a cost of living rise, about a review of what the job was now. So we needed uh, increased knowledge, we needed increased skills, we had much more paperwork to complete, reports, observation. So it was becoming very much more demanding. Nursery nurses were predominantly women and the starting salary was around £10,000. At the time, that was £12,000 below the UK average. I think we wanted recognition yeah. for the job we were doing. Jobs had changed quite dramatically. Yeah. There was massive yeah, changes. Huge, and huge changes. changes. And we hadn't been regraded for um, 15 years. Yeah. I mean, it's a long time. Council-run nurseries across Scotland are facing massive disruption after nursery nurses voted for indefinite strike action. All but six of Scotland's councils will be hit. How did you come to that decision to go for a strike ballot? What happened was the employers were just frustrating us. They come back with a notional figure that would happen, which in actual fact would have left some nursery nurses in the country worse off. And we then said, well, we've got no choice to be recognised for the role that we do. Support Scotland's nursery nurses. Thank you very much. You're Thanks welcome. Very much. This is on one of our trips to London, yeah. So we were there to raise awareness and to hopefully try and get some money to help us survive, basically. After that one. Oh, yeah, after that one, yeah, that went, one. We went for tea and they said, oh, I've got a special um, treat for you. And we said, uh, all right, well, what's that? And he said, well, I'm, you're going to go, um, <laughs> you're going to go to a theatre and you're going to be on stage with the Libertines. I was like, who's the Libertines? <laughs> I had no idea who they were. It was thousands. It was really, really, 2,000 people, it yeah. says. Um, I just remember getting up those stairs and they were all standing, the band members were standing on the stage and we got up in our raincoats. <laughs> and I just stood oh. there and I went, hello everybody, with my hands up in the air like something you would see on television. And they're all like, Wah! And they were cheer, cheer, cheering. Oh. And then we couldn't believe it when we read it in that paper that said that one of the biggest cheers of the night went to the striking Scottish nursery nurse who spoke about their fight against low pay. Oh, famous. By late spring 2004, the unions agreed to discuss local pay deals. Gradually, councils negotiated and the nursery nurses returned to work. Those in Glasgow, the Borders and Orkney were the last to settle. As well as being the biggest all-out strike since the miners, at around 14 weeks, it was also the longest. I'd done a quite a few speeches throughout the dispute. We did a return to work one, didn't yeah. we? Yeah. We started at um, the start of the strike, saying that myself and fellow nursery nurses were tired, fed up and angry. Today, however, I think it's time to change these words. I hope you will all agree that now we have come to the end of this dispute. We are united, strong and proud. Um, Oh, I think I've said <laughs> That's ridiculous. Yeah. My biggest thing was, I think, the impression that I gave my children. 
I think they learned a lot about their mum and also about how important it is for women to stand up for their rights. And they, I think what they were thinking, well, if my mum can do that, then I, I'm going to do that too. We knew that we were never going to go back and be treated the way we were treated again. It's amazing when you've got a fire in your belly what you can do. Yeah. It just takes over. I think they do feel recognised more than they were in the past. Um, could they get more? Could society as a whole still reflect on what they think of as women's work? I think there's a lot more work to be done in that sense. The experience of the nursery nurses showed just how easy it was for women's work and women's contributions to be undervalued. It's a pattern repeated for centuries. Women are conspicuous by their absence from our history books and our public spaces. In 2013, a survey found that there are just 20 statues of women in Scotland, and five of those are of Queen Victoria. One is here, in Glasgow's George Square, where it's joined by 11 other statues, all of men. But in the last two decades, women have worked to change this, claiming the present and also reclaiming our past. Around 2,500 people have taken part in a procession in Edinburgh to mark the centenary of the suffragette movement. On this day, 100 years ago, women, children and men took up banners and flags and joined a rally along Princess Street. Women were finally awarded the vote in 1928. In 2009, Dr Fiona Skillen was one of the organisers of a celebration of women's history. It was called the Good Cause March and she was joined by Dr Val Wright. We actually ended up making the banner that was carried at the head of the procession. Mm -hmm. I didn't realise until I seen the photos when you said yeah. that her banner was right up the front and I was like, no. Yeah. <laughs> A good cause, Max, a strong arm, um, was one of the kind of key slogans of the suffragettes, mm -hmm. Scottish suffragettes. So it seemed a no-brainer to be the name of the project. The Good Cause March came about because we wanted to not only commemorate this centenary, but also to get women re-energised, I guess, about politics at a local level, but also at a national level. People came from all over Scotland, just as they had done in 1909. What we had agreed with the police was that as we marched, they would close a road, let everybody pass, reopen the road, we would continue and close the next road and so on. And in the conversations, they were saying, oh, so what are you expecting? Maybe two, three hundred, maybe a thousand people? And, and it was quite kind of patronising and dismissive. And we were like, no, no, we think there'll be a bit more than that. You know, we're thinking between two, and th maybe, maybe two thousand, three thousand. Um, and then on the day, 5,000 people showed up and it was just, it was fantastic. It felt like a, a moment yeah. in history. It's not often that you get that, no. I suppose, as historians. We just, you know, we go through it and we study yeah. the other significant moments, but it's not often yeah. that you find yourself among a big crowd of people and you think, well, this is actually quite significant. And sort yeah. of sharing that space yeah. together, it was, it, it was, it was pretty was... emotional. There was also some unexpected fun. In the early hours before the procession, a kind of group of, <laughs> of guerrilla feminists, if we want to call them that, um, went out and decided to dress male statues along the route of the procession. Yeah. They dressed them as women, so they gave them, you know, headscarves and, yeah. and pinnies and skirts and and some, you know, sort of uh, sashes, suffrage sashes. Were you quite things. surprised by that in the day there? Yeah, like we didn't. The we didn't know it was happening, and I guess you know it's it is illegal to have to have done that. So I <laughs> guess they perhaps protected us from that by not telling us they were planning to do it. The people we see represented in these statues don't represent all of us. Yeah, you know, and we should challenge that. Yeah. In Glasgow, a few years later, a group of campaigners did challenge that, organising to mark a key moment in Govan's history. They wanted to celebrate the collective action led by a woman in 1915. Mary Barber was a campaigner in Govan on housing issues, particularly during the First World War. The men were away at war and the private landlords thought, well, here's an opportunity. We can bump up rents and there's nobody here to fight us and the women organised, Mary Barber led their campaign to have a rent strike. 
and she won. And later on, post-war, the, the, the law was changed to give people more rights in relation to, to rents. Here was a woman whose life and achievements were invisible. They were invisible because she was a woman. They were invisible because she was a working class woman. A campaign was launched called Remember Mary Barber with some high profile donors. It was headed up by now retired MP Maria Fife. And in 2018, a statue was unveiled at Govan Cross. On the day of the actual unveiling of the, the statue, it was a joyous day. It was just lovely. It was just one of these things we thought, well, I can't think of any many people in Maria Fife would pull this off. Mary Barber fought to have her voice heard, and a hundred years later, other women fought to tell her story. I love the fact that this is not just a statue of Mary, but it shows women leading the way, making other people's lives better. When it comes to stories about Scotland's past, one has lit up our screens in recent years and led to an influx of tourists from all over the world. Here at the 14th century Dune Castle, one of Scotland's most famous landmarks, visitors have tripled. And it's thanks to one American woman, the creator of Outlander, Diana Gabaldone. Thank you so much. Oh, it's my pleasure. I've read all your books for the last six months for the first Oh, lovely. Oh, well, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed them. Yeah. <laughs> the first book was published in 1991, but it was the launch of the television series in 2014 that turbocharged what's been dubbed the Outlander effect. Your books have changed our lives. Oh, you know what? we I didn't know, know each my, other. I, no, we didn't know each other, but I didn't know myself till I read your books. Oh, really? Well, how, how, what a nice thing to say. That's very lovely. I'm to myself. How terrific. I've become a woman, I think. Ah, so. well, thank you. <laughs> I'm glad to hear that. And at 50, that's quite something. <laughs> yes, <it> actually, it <laughs> is. <laughs> Tell me what you knew about Scotland before you began this wonderful adventure. Basically, nothing. <laughs> I. Uh, had always wanted to be a writer, and uh, it took me until I was 35 to decide to do it. I came out and said, well, all right, why not? I'm going to write a book. It doesn't matter where. Why not? Scotland, 18th century. I went immediately then to the university library, mm -hmm. looked up Scotland Highlands, 18th century, went through and picked out everything that looked interesting. Outlander tells the story of a strong-willed World War II nurse, Claire. She time travels back to the 18th century, where life for women is very different. Good. Now I have your attention. And you're going to listen to me. So you gave women more characterful I suppose roles. so, yeah. Well, even a very domestic life can have a lot of drama in it. Exactly. It's just uh, which sort of story do you choose to tell? But what you did, I suppose, was clear, was you gave her a very strong personality. She could have came with that, you know. <laughs> She might possibly have inherited it from me. I uh, went to a Catholic school. I was educated by nuns, you know. <laughs> this is sort of my de facto woman, you know, that you should have carry a strong character. Yeah, yeah. Outlander is in its seventh season, and Visit Scotland estimates that an extra one and a half million people a year now visit its locations. What is it like for you to have this extraordinary Outlander effect, you know, it's quite something staggering. you created. You know, people say to me, uh, you know, what sort of books do you write? Usually I say, yeah, they write the kind of books that make people want to go to Scotland. <laughs> and they do. Because that's the guess they do. And do they write to you after they've been? Many of them do, yeah. I've never had one write to me and say, oh, I went to Scotland tonight because of your books and I hated it. Uh, but they uh, quite the opposite. When people come to Scotland today, they find a country that feels different to its old macho image. Now, female leaders are to the fore. And our first female First Minister is also the longest serving. I interviewed her in 1992 when she was 21 and just starting out in politics. 
Hello. This first left, right and centre of election year is devoted to the political issues that matter to young Scots. The panel itself has a more youthful air than usual. Nicola Sturgeon is the convener of the Young Scottish Nationalists and her party's youngest parliamentary candidate. She has a Herculean task, though. She's standing in Glasgow, Shettleston, where the Labour majority is almost 19,000, one of the largest in Scotland. To what extent do you think a more visible female parliamentary group has changed the attitudes to Scotland, in Scotland, and also internationally? I, I think the Scottish Parliament in itself has changed the, the image and the standing of Scotland, both at home and internationally, but also a parliament that has a bigger number of women in it, and therefore a parliament that is by no means gender balanced, but looks more female, has, I think, over the years of the Scottish Parliament, softened that macho image. Uh, and not just in terms of the sort of representation and the image of that, but in the policies that the Scottish Parliament has prioritised, much more of a, a social agenda that I think is driven by the greater number of women in Parliament. I don't know, genuinely don't know, we'd have to check this, whether there has ever been a parliament anywhere else in the world uh, where the leaders of all the main parties happen to be women at the same time. There's no doubt that that was a very positive uh, visual representation of what politics can be like. But you're not at 50-50. No, and we're not. And in the year since the Scottish Parliament was established, we've you know gone forward and then backwards and now a bit forward again. What we thought of at that time as real progress has been quite transient. One of the things I thought was really shocking was the, the New Statesman cover and had yourself, uh, Theresa May, Liz Kendall and Angela Merkel on the front. What, what did you think about that? Um, I, was, I was pretty appalled by it and, and also, I suppose, quite hurt by it because there is this sense in politics, if you're a woman in politics without children, there's an assumption made about you. I don't have children. My predecessor as SNP leader doesn't have children either. I don't recall a single interview in which Alex Hammond was asked why he didn't have children. Whereas for a period in my life, political career, I sometimes felt as if I couldn't do an interview without being asked that question. So there you go. There in, in the case of two politicians, you, you see very, very starkly that differential treatment. Tell me about what you think the situation is for young women looking at the political landscape and whether they want to be part of it. Are we going forward? I, I struggle to stay optimistic on this front and I'm, I'm determined that I, I do stay optimistic or at least don't give in mm. to a sense of, of despair. But I think the environment for women in politics today is much harsher um, actually more hostile, and I would use that word deliberately, than it has been at any time in my political career. Social media provides a vehicle for the most awful abuse of women, uh, the misogyny, sexism, threats of violence, sexual violence that women who put their heads above the parapet are subjected to, is making it, I think, much harder to encourage women that it's something worth doing, and that worries me deeply. Social media can give us a voice, but speaking out often comes at a price. Abuse that's directed disproportionately at women. I hope they get assassinated. To a large proportion of Scotland, she's just a daft wee lassie. We will not forget her behaviour, nor listen to her. Nobody in Scotland hated her for being a woman. We hated her for being a squinty-moothed, lying yoon. Prominent women who are leaders in Scotland face a barrage of abuse, from remarks about their appearance to death threats. And I know what that kind of hostility feels like too. Social media is toxic and it's relentless. Campaigner Talat Yacoub has been monitoring the impact this has been having on women in politics. 
What we're seeing at the moment is a bit of a revolving door with candidates and women MSPs and local councillors who are more likely to do one term and then leave because of the exclusionary cultures, the toxic culture they've experienced, the sexism they've experienced. The critical thing we have to do is tackle toxic cultures within politics. So when women are there, they actually want to stay, they want to participate. That is a safe space to do so. In 2014, Talat co-founded a new 50-50 campaign. Its aim is to make the parties commit to equal representation, but it doesn't stop there. It was only in the last election in 2021 that we saw the first woman of colour elected to the Scottish Parliament, and it was the first permanent wheelchair user that has been elected to the Scottish Parliament. One of the worst things that we can do is to assume that women are a homogenous group. When we do that, it is women who are already marginalised and ignored. They're the ones that are ignored further. In 2018, an exhibition commissioned by the charity Zero Tolerance set out to represent the experiences of a broad range of women and shed light on the abuse they can suffer. The photographer was Alicia Bruce. It was called Violence Unseen. It was about making prominent some of the voices that may not be represented so prominently in campaigns about gender-based violence or things that people hadn't really considered, may not have considered. When people speak about domestic abuse, they think it's a sort of one-to-one -one thing that happens in a home, but actually, because of the internet, people are accessed in different ways now. And also to think about how it's not as easy for women from different backgrounds to just leave a marriage because it could put their lives gravely in danger. And how um, the solutions aren't always the same for women from different walks of life. It was important for Margaret to include her mobility scooter because of the freedom that that gives her. Like all my work, it was very collaborative. The process was very collaborative. Maridal Wadwa works for Rape Crisis. We arrived at the messages that this picture gives uh, in a sort of mutually collaborative way, which is like a very feminist way of working. Um, for so many women fleeing abuse, you often don't have much time to take what belongs to you when you flee. Um, so you take what matters. So you'll see there are a few saris on there. Uh, two of them are very important saris to me. Some things are more important to me as a, as a brown trans migrant woman than maybe to others. And so everything that's on that sofa in the suitcase in front are things that matter to me. As a society, our understanding of abuse has changed, both what it can look like and how it operates. Nicola Borthwick has experienced this firsthand. Everything that I'd ever seen or heard about domestic abuse was completely different, actually, from what I'd experienced. It was much more gradual, much more controlling, so I couldn't really define what it was at the time. I wasn't able to control my own finances. I wasn't able to control who I saw and when I saw them. My relationship with my family was controlled and, and um, I was basically, I lived in a state of intense fear and intense stress for almost the entire seven years. Organisations like Women's Aid had been hearing testimony like Nicola's for decades. But without a name for this kind of abuse, it was hard to get people to take it seriously. A key development in Scotland's understanding of domestic abuse came in 2007, when the American sociologist Evan Stark published a game-changing book. In it, he named the emotional and psychological abuse that often traumatises and traps women. He called it coercive control. The CEO of Scottish Women's Aid, Dr Marcia Scott, remembers this moment well. It was like a light bulb moment for an awful lot of us because it took what we knew in our guts and it gave it a theoretical framework that we could work with. It was a, a switch that we've been trying to flip for such a long time. The question isn't, why doesn't she leave? The question is, why do we let him keep doing this to her? Before 2018, Scotland had no specific domestic abuse law. And when cases did reach court, the onus was on the survivor. 
Women were um, incredibly afraid of the system because they knew that in order to demonstrate enough harm in, in, the, in the case, in order to get a conviction, they were gonna have to parade their trauma. And it was a lose-lose because women, if they were, if they were really emotional and, and demonstrated how upset and, and f frightened and angry they were about having been treated this way, they were hysterical and they couldn't really be relied on. And if they were calmer and had more of a flat affect, also a common response to trauma, um, they were lying. Scottish Women's Aid lobbied the government to bring in a domestic abuse law, one that would incorporate the testimony of survivors and use it to shift the focus onto the behaviour of the perpetrators. It was a revolutionary approach. I went along to the Scottish Parliament um, and met with the Justice Committee and gave them a personal testimony of what I had experienced in detail. It was very emotionally draining. It was reliving some of the very upsetting and traumatic events that I had previously lived through. But I really felt very passionately about not just seeking justice for myself, but seeking something that will affect the cultural conversation around domestic abuse moving forward for the next generation. Thank you, Sign Officer. And can I thank all members for their positive contributions? And the In 2018, the, the final draft of the Domestic Abuse Bill was brought before the Scottish Parliament by Justice Secretary Michael Matheson. Society that we all want to see. It's a bill that makes clear that the pernicious and the horrific coercive and controlling behaviour that degrades and humiliates women in particular is now within our criminal laws uh, scope. Today, we as a parliament stand with Dorothy, Nicola and the many others who have spoken up on domestic abuse. Without their courage and their determination, we wouldn't be here today. When you actually see that announcement happen in Parliament, and when your own name is read out in Parliament, it felt hugely thrilling and satisfying, and that has never gone away. I still feel really delighted about that. The motion is therefore agreed, and the Domestic Abuse Scotland Bill is passed. And to see the parliamentarians get up and turn to the public gallery and give a standing ovation was beyond my even wildest imagination. I have quoted Evan Stark's um, uh, comment to The Guardian after this bill was passed, saying this is now the world's new gold standard for domestic violence um, legislation. It's an extraordinary thing for a little country like Scotland to be, to be, you know, demonstrating that we can do this differently and better. It was a really important healing experience for me to be able to have that sort of personal control over my life. I also really didn't want everything that I had suffered and my family had suffered to be a waste of time, to be wasted years. I really wanted it to have meant something, to have become something better than it was ever intended to be. The legislation on coercive control brought a behaviour that had been hidden out into the open. And women in Scotland would lead the way in tackling another global issue that for a long time had been unseen and largely unspoken. Period poverty. The world I grew up in was one in which periods, or at least we called it the curse, was somehow private, embarrassing and shameful. And although it happened to half the population, we just pretended it didn't. But period time is also a time of great expense. Some women have to spend up to 13 pounds a month, and over a lifetime, that can add up to more than 5,000 pounds. This meant that those who struggled to afford period products were often left to suffer in silence. I used to manage a refuge in Women's Aid years ago, and when I admitted a woman to a refuge, you know, I would give her a care package, food, you know, all the essentials, and in that would always be, you know, menstrual products. We never had the language back then to call it period poverty. Victoria was a member of Women for Independence and was studying social work when she decided to investigate the issue. 
So I started, you know, scouring um, academia, you know, looking for journals, looking for peer reviewed things, and I was just getting nothing. I said, I think it's time, you know, that women in Scotland had their place to talk about, you know, their life, because how can you design for society if you don't know the journey of the average woman, you know, that you live next door to as well? Victoria designed and launched a survey in 2017. As well as looking at poverty, it exposed the lack of education and discussion around periods in everyday life. When I started to analyse the results, what struck me was, was that one in four people had experienced period poverty at one point in their life. 17% of those one in four people cited money as the main factor that stopped them from actually being able to manage their period too. There were so many other factors that came into play as well, and one of those other areas was stigma and shame. Obviously, domestic abuse was one of the most frightening factors as well, but humiliation and shame, coupled by financial deprivation, is something that is going to impact a woman's life or, participate, or participation in society as well. Victoria's research provided much needed data and helped to inspire politicians like Labour's Monica Lennon. We have to act now because if we don't act now, the problem will, will get worse. And we know that young people's education uh, suffers and that's not good for, for society as a whole. After running pilot schemes beginning in Aberdeen, the government started offering free products in schools, colleges and universities. But when COVID-19 struck, it exposed the scale of the problem. Jenny Keenan is part of a charity in Perth and Kinross, one of many grassroots organisations that took action. We started providing products uh, probably about six months before the first lockdown, basically just providing products in our bathroom so that people could take those away. But when the first lockdown was clearly coming and we were told schools were going to close and we knew that our own offices were likely to close, we became aware that there was going to need to be another solution. So the Tampon Taxi is a free period product delivery service and we have volunteers who make deliveries throughout Perth and Kinross. When we first started out it was just send us a text or a WhatsApp message and we'll, we'll bring you products and we thought that's quite simple, it's quite small scale and actually we were blown away by the need immediately. I would say we were doing 10 to 20 orders a week and that was just in, in Perth City. That felt like a lot of the time. We now do between two and 300 orders a month and they go all over Perth and Kinross. The Tampon Taxi Project highlighted how location can be one of the biggest challenges. If you live in a really remote rural area, the first barrier is going to be access. So if you have one local store, products are likely to be quite expensive and there's not likely to be a lot of choice. We asked the local authority if we could stop talking about period poverty and start talking about period dignity. Um, and for us, that's about that universality. It's about access to the scheme for anyone. In Parliament, Monica Lennon continued to push for change. We must get on and do this because we have constituents today who are worried about where their next pad or tampon is coming from. When it came to the first stage of the free period product bill in the Scottish Parliament, Monica, who had led the, the creation of the bill, had invited me along and um, she had asked me to, you know, say a few words, you know, there was other um, campaigners, trade unionists, and just there was a collective movement of everyone that had actually been a driver in this space over the years. Our Scottish Parliament, they weren't debating against period products, they were having a discussion to say this is why we need the bill. In the last half hour, Scotland has made history and become the first country in the world to give free access to items such as tampons and sanitary products. In November 2020, the bill was passed unanimously. It means in practice that no matter where you live in Scotland, if you need free period products, you will get them. Changing the culture, changing the language and changing the tone, for me, that was the biggest thing to win in all of this as well, because we have now brought periods into the discourse of everyday life as well. It's not as stigmatised as the way it used to be. 
it was so significant. When you look at what's going on around the world on a global scale, you know, every day you see women's rights being taken away. Controversy still surrounds a number of women's issues. 50 years of a legally enshrined right to abortion in the United States has been brought to an end. Abortion has been a legal right in Britain since 1968. But more than 50 years later, not everyone is in agreement, as Lucy Grieve and Alice Murray discovered while they were students at Edinburgh University and witnessed protests outside Chalmers Sexual Health Centre. And what was happening outside here? Um, so they were standing outside Chalmers Centre here um, every day over October, uh, handing out leaflets. The leaflets uh, often had like misinformation on them about what happens when you get an abortion, about the size of a fetus. Uh, they had signs and they were speaking to passers-by. Some uh, women, you know, that have uh, been, um, you know, called murderers by them. We even heard from a woman uh, that went in, she'd actually just been sexually assaulted and she went to Chalmers to get um, checked up after it. And she came outside kind of, you know, dazed and confused a little bit and uh, they approached her directly. I think people um, kind of maybe slightly naively assume that that wasn't something that happened here. We know we're really used to seeing the anti-abortion protests maybe in America um, and they just thought that that was something that didn't happen. Lucy and Alice became increasingly concerned about how these protests were affecting people who needed to access the centre. And Alice had first-hand experience of what this felt like. So I found out that I was pregnant in my third year of uni. Um, and so when I went for my initial appointment, there was protesters outside. And I think you just don't expect that. Was that upsetting? I think at first I was very angry. Uh, I felt frustrated that, you know, these people outside had questioned whether I had thought over my decision. Um, you know, they say that they're there to offer you the other side and to give information. I found that really, uh, ang you know, it made me feel really angry. And, but then afterwards, uh, when reflecting on my situation, I definitely felt really sad about that. Um, I think it meant that I just didn't think about my experience as much because they'd sort of tarnished any ways that I would reflect on it. In October 2020, Lucy, Alice and others launched a campaign called Back Off Scotland. They petitioned the local council to implement 150 metre buffer zones around healthcare facilities. So when we started Back Off Scotland, it was essentially mobilising the local community. So that was the local community um, at Edinburgh Uni. But soon we started to realise that that problem was actually widespread across Scotland. It was in, you know, six of the 14 health board areas. Uh, and, and women were contacting us with really deeply upsetting stories where they had to terminate a much wanted pregnancy and then they came out of the hospital and they're, they're, they're confronted by pictures of you know, very graphic mutilated fetuses. Scenes like this are a regular occurrence outside clinics and hospitals offering abortion. They say they want to help, but for many women, it's an unwelcome intervention. People have the right to free speech, the right to protest. They don't have a right to an audience. But also, I think um, primarily it has to be viewed as an access to healthcare. It wouldn't be tolerated in any other healthcare setting. So where is the appropriate place for this? I think, you know, the appropriate place to protest is, you know, maybe outside Parliament. Nicola Sturgeon has suggested uh, to these protesters that if they have an issue, they should come to her directly, you know, they should bring it up with elected officials uh, and not those who are entering clinics. Two legal rights have come into conflict here, the right to protest and the right to an abortion. Thanks in part to Alice and Lucy's lobbying, a bill on buffer zones was introduced in the Scottish Parliament. I think it'd be a really good chance for Scotland to show that they are, you know, world leading in women's health care. Uh, I think it's a really good opportunity to be that. Young women in Scotland have been stepping up, making sure their voices are heard. In 2005, a group of seven teenagers made the headlines. Known as the Glasgow Girls, they launched a campaign to stop the deportation of their friend, Agnesa. Really glad that the people are very interested in our story, but inside I scared as well because I don't have any papers. I'm very afraid that they come to our door in the middle of night and me and my sister is sleeping. And they take us away, like just lay down to Agnesa. Um, there's nothing I can do about it. Rosa Sally was one of them. 
She is now the first refugee in Scotland to be elected a councillor. The campaign started very small from a school, it went to, to the UK uh, Parliament and then became a global change in the United Nations Charter. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it just shows that, you know, being a child, your voice is, voice matters. Agnesa had been removed from her home by UK immigration authorities in what is known as a dawn raid. The Glasgow girls were campaigning for an end to this practice and for an end to child detention. Today we're bringing the debate about children of asylum seekers to the attention of this parliament. I want to welcome the young people in the gallery this morning who attend Drum Chapel High School. Their efforts have been exemplary. It just impresses me to look back and to see what we have accomplished as Glasgow girls. Um, and of course, the Glasgow girls wasn't just the seven of us. Um, there was a whole community behind us. Say it loud and say it clear! Refugees and refugees! Say it loud and say it clear! Like Rosa, Pinar Aksu's experience of dawn raids led to activism. She was born in Turkey and now campaigns for the rights of refugees and asylum seekers. Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! Our streets! When did you first realise that great injustice was being done? As you saw we it. experienced ourselves um, detention when my family was seeking asylum uh, around uh, 2008 and 2009. And at the time, I was 14, 15 years old and I didn't know what was happening. After several years living in Glasgow, like Agnesa, Pinar's family were taken from their home in a dawn raid. They were sent to a detention centre and faced deportation. What was that like for a 15-year-old and with younger siblings and with, for your mum and dad? I would say it was like a prison. I, the only difference between the prison and detention is in prison, you know when you're going to be out. In detention, you don't know when you're going to be out. So what did your teachers think was happening? They were amazing. Like They, <laughs> they, they immediately started um, uh, informing my friends in the school and then they started um, gathering like sport letters mm -hmm. from my classmates um, and from my teachers. And now your family has uh, full citizenship? Yeah, now we've got relief to remain, so that's that's that yeah. was all in the past. But I guess that's where sort of the activism started, because after that, uh, my teachers and everyone was suggested, oh, do you mind sharing your story mm -hmm. so that you can, everyone else can hear how unfair it is. And then after doing that for a few years, I just started to realise wait a minute, you know, this is something we experience and it's not stopped. I always say this, I don't think it was something that I wanted to do, like doing activism or anything. It, it, I think it found me. Would you go down the route of kind of formal politics? I don't think at this moment there are any political parties that is in line with my view and represents what I'm in my views. So not now, but who knows in the future we might end up creating another <laughs> alliance or a group <laughs> that might be in, in line with um, yeah, equality, fairness, and um, a space where it would create a welcoming country in, in Scotland. Pinar is doing a PhD on art and law in migration. A key moment in her activism was in 2021, following a dawn raid in Kenmuir Street in Glasgow. Two men had been detained in a van. She was one of the many who'd been on high alert beforehand. Tell me what happened at Kemio Street and how you became involved. We started to share the news that, look, everybody, just be on alert that there's immigration vans going around. They might be picking up people, they might be doing dawn raids. And just after two, three weeks, that's when we heard then the, uh, the raids, the dawn raids in, in, on Kenmuir Street. My phone was just ringing and messaging and somebody just said, look, there's another dawn raid that's happening. For hours, there was a peaceful, but determined standoff between police and protesters, one under the van to stop it from moving. We were chanting continuously the whole day, and it was just such a, such an amazing atmosphere. And then we started calling some of the politicians, some of uh, the lawyers as well. One of my friends, she gave me the, her phone and she was like, read this out, it's a statement from Police Scotland. Following a suitable risk assessment, Operation of the to release the man. 
And that moment was just so special. We ask everybody to kind of clear the path for the van. After a day of protests here in Glasgow and a very heavy police presence, the two men who spent the day in the back of that van are now out and heading towards a local mosque. That was just absolutely magical. Rosa Sally was also in the crowd at Kemmuir Street that day. See that moment when they announced that they will be released? Like, I had tears in my eyes and lots of people were very emotional and we just felt like, you know, we won. The power of people is very strong. So I just, I thought that was just an amazing feeling for everybody in the community. It was Rosa's activism that led her to a career in politics. I wanted to be a voice um, for minorities, uh, be a voice for those who are not being heard, um, seeking asylum, and the kind of journey has led me to be elected. So um, it, it's very emotional for me, of course, because you know, it is my life that um, it just shows that um, the journey has been challenging and uh, rocky sometimes, but I, I've made it to be a counsellor now. This new generation of young activists is living in a world which can still be a difficult place for women. The continuing prevalence of violence and abuse and the toxic environment on social media can be disheartening. But in the darker moments, it's important to remember just how much has already changed. Scotland is a completely different country to what it was 50 years ago. And women working together have led much of that transformation. There's still some way to go though, so the world better watch out. Women have been hugely influential at all levels of politics in Scotland, but what did it take for them to become involved? And why isn't there gender equality in the Scottish Parliament still? To watch interviews with women who have been on that journey and those just setting out, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash modern Scotland and follow the links to the Open University.